but noise. It's nothing but noise. Coming up from the products we use in our hair to our homes and fast food packaging. Forever chemicals, as they're called, are polluting the world around us and in us. Once in the bodies of humans and animals, PFAS stay there for a long time. We look at these toxic and controversial chemical compounds, what they are. I think it's one of the more serious threats we have. And whether we can do anything to get rid of them. This is a really difficult, um, <laughs> a difficult issue. This is Just Two Degrees on TRT World. For decades, we've used man-made substances to make our lives easier, specifically ones we use to repel water, oil and fat. They're called PFAs and they form the strongest bonds in all of chemistry. The scientists describe them as forever chemicals. PFAS refer to per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances. They consist of carbon and fluorine molecules which, when combined, create one of the strongest chemical compounds made by man. A bond so strong, it acts like a straitjacket. PFAS are highly resistant to liquids and acids. They repel oil and water. PFAS are used in products that prevent stains when you have a spill on your furniture. And they're used to waterproof shoes. The most notorious PFAS has several names, including C8 and the commonly known Teflon. They're also used to produce Scotchgard, Cortex, Stain Master, and more. Stain or water repellent, heat resistant nonstick materials and treatments have made our lives more convenient for nearly 80 years. They've had countless applications paints, sealants, gaskets, lubricants, personal care items, including makeup, dental floss, shampoo, and nail polish. Food packaging like pizza boxes, candy wrappers, and microwave popcorn bags. Synthetic fabrics used to make our clothes like polyester, nylon, and more. Mikhail Malik, Just Two Degrees. Well, there's no doubt PFAs have had a profound impact on our everyday lives, relieving us of mundane tasks and making essential ones easier. But if we've learned anything about man-made chemicals over the years, is that there's almost always a catch. PFAS can contaminate the environment during the manufacturing process. They never fully degrade. They spread quickly into great distances from the source. Their remnants end up in our drinking water and soil. They enter fertilizer via wastewater treatment plants, exposing fish and livestock. Once in the bodies of humans and animals, PFAS stay there for a long time. They can increase the risk of certain cancers, induce high cholesterol, compromise the immune system, and cause reproductive and developmental defects. Where did PFAs come from? Well, in the 1950s and 60s, fluorocarbons were celebrated. Without them, we wouldn't have space travel, artificial heart valves, and nuclear power. Here's what we know about the origin of these harmful compounds. The chemist Joseph H. Simons invented the process for making PFAS in the 1930s. It first showed up on an industrial scale in the 1940s, virtually indestructible and useful for separating uranium during the Manhattan Project, a U.S.-led program that led to the development of the first nuclear weapons. The Manhattan Project also used PFAS to create firefighting foam because it was superior at extinguishing flames. And for decades, regular military and civil service firefighter training and emergency response across the world has exposed soil and water sources to the chemicals. Around the same time, the manufacturing company 3M and a multinational chemical company, DuPont, became the leading producers of PFAS used by the military and later the civilian sector. In 1951, DuPont built the first Teflon factory using PFAS in Parkersburg, West Virginia, near the Ohio River. The company has been sued multiple times for dumping thousands of tons of the chemical into its waters. Scientists began to notice the presence of fluorocarbons in human blood in the 1960s. But that's also when mass production of household and everyday items made with them went into high gear. Now they're in our drinking water and soil. Landfills leach it into the ground and surface water. They're in biosolids used as fertilizer on farms. 
therein our food, especially seafood. They contaminate the air, and they're found in the blood of every human, including babies. They have another name, legacy chemicals or legacy contaminants. Perfect eggs don't always start with the egg. Until we find a way to remove them, they're here to stay. Sarah Balter, Just Two Degrees. Well, let's talk with Dr. Anna Lenquist about these forever chemicals. Dr. Lenquist is a senior toxicologist at ChemSec, which says it's an independent, non-profit organization that advocates for the substitution uh, of toxic chemicals for safer alternatives. Doctor, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Um, firstly, how much would you consider PFAs a serious, serious threat to humans and the environment? I think it's one of the more serious threats we have. Uh, we have had uh, scientists conclude recently that we have overstepped the planetary boundaries when it comes to PFAS. And uh, the reason for them making that conclusion is that we find uh, the levels are constantly increasing because these substances do not break down. And we now find that very many parts of the world in drinking water and rainwater and groundwater, levels that are coming very close to what is or even surpassing levels that are safe for human consumption to drink and, and for animals. Uh, the question I'm going to ask you is quite chemical, technical, but I'm going to ask you to to make it as uh, layman as you can. Um, what is it, is it about the chemistry of PFAs that make them toxic? Mm. So PFAS is a huge group of different chemicals, but they have one thing in common, and that is that they have a, a backbone of carbon atoms and that fluorine atoms are bound to those. And it is this very bond between a carbon atom and the fluorine atom that is super strong and one of the strongest sort of bonds in the world. And this makes them both very useful because they can resist um, degradation, high temperatures, high voltages, fires, but that also is also causing the problems because they remain in the environment more or less forever, as the name is called, and also within us, in our blood, and so forth. And we've learned that these things can build up in the human body. Um, where do they go in the human body? Where do they stay? And what happens when they come in contact with human blood or tissue, per se? Mm. Um, so PFAS, they bind to proteins that we have in our body at different levels. And uh, it's still a lot remain to, to understand when it comes to health effects of PFAS. Already we can, uh, there are quite many diseases or human health issues that can be linked to PFAS exposure, but there are probably many more to be discovered. Um, and uh, the mechanism behind this different toxicity are different. So we have many different types of proteins in our body and some of our receptors for hormones and some are receptors for gene transcription. Uh, so they have, they can act in very different ways by, by blocking or binding uh, to different types of, of proteins mainly. Mm. Are there levels of these chemicals that the human body can tolerate? Yes, that is a, a very good discussion and a debate that is to be had. Um, we have probably not sort of studied the lowest level of where health effects can be seen. And, and the trend is now that there are coming more and more studies seeing effects on lower and lower levels of PFAS. At the same, same time, we have more and more studies showing higher and higher levels of PFAS in people and in the environment. Um, and these are also chemicals that act uh, as endocrine disruptors or interfere with our hormones. And uh, we know as a fact that this type of chemicals or this type of effects, when, when hormones are involved, there is typically no lower safe threshold value because hormones in our bodies, they act at so very low doses. So even a low dose can, can interfere with all those mechanisms. So according to some reports, we've all been um, exposed to PFAs. Uh, some of us still are at some level. Um, why don't we all get sick? Why don't we all get kidney failure or, or certain types of cancers? Yes, I think that is uh, it's a very good question. And it's, it's probably the same with all these types of hazardous chemicals that we have in our surrounding. And that we might tolerate them and we might tolerate them for a while and we may be differently... Uh, we have different levels and we are differently sensitive to them. 
And uh, also when we talk about chemicals that interfere with our hormones, it can also be the case that even if we have an exposure now, um, an effect such as a cancer or a, um, some, something that damages reproduction might not be visible until decades later or not even in, in the next generation. Um, but humans and also animals, of course, are complex. We are exposed to so many different things. We have other, we are, have dietary um, differences. We have other health uh, disorders. We're exposed to different things. We live in different ways. We exercise. All of that uh, goes into this complex um, equation of, of sort of what, yeah. Then it's fair to, is it fair to assume that people with pre-existing certain pre-existing conditions would be more susceptible to getting sick if they're exposed to PFAs? Um, I, th I would suspect so, but I don't think that that is enough studied yet. Mm. Uh, I would be surprised if that would be the case and if more studies like that would show up, but it is not, I don't, cannot point at any specific studies at, at this point. It might be, but I might not be aware of it. I gotcha. So we know we, 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 uh, 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 we get these PFAs in our homes specifically uh, through our taps, but what other, other ways through our grease uh, proof pans, through our walls? How do PFAs move from, say, the paint in our walls and the, uh, the, the surface of our uh, cooking utensils into our bodies? Mm, I think there are different ways. So uh, it's usually said that uh, the, the most, or where we get the most PFAS is from, from food and from drinks. So that's kind of easy to understand. We get it in our bodies. Uh, some shorted PFAS might also be transported in air and in uh, like, um, um, what do you say, um, aqueous water or what small water droplets in the air. Mm. Uh, if you have a paint on the wall, um, it's, um, it might fall off into dust or similar, but that would probably be lower levels. And I think the, the general pro problem is that we use and produce so much so that the sort of background level everywhere in the environment is relatively high. And it's therefore quite difficult to, to escape or to, to minimize your own exposure. In terms of Teflon pens, it's more obvious that, that these chemicals, when heated, can also leak like from the coating and we scrape it off. You see it even if you have, have a used pan and that it's uh, scratches and you've probably eaten that. So. There are different ways that we wow. get this into place. Well, Doctor, this has been really helpful. Appreciate it. Well, it should be mentioned that 3M and DuPont, as far back as the 1950s, were aware of the toxicity of PFAs, yet the company kept that secret from employees and the public for decades. That's according to the Environmental Working Group, Organization of Environmental Advocates and Scientists. Well, the impacts of those initial decisions and choices have had far-reaching consequences. A study in 2022 found that even rainwater contains PFAs. Researchers from Stockholm University say that means it's unsafe to drink rainwater anywhere on the planet. It's still, even if you go to Antarctica or to or, um, the Tibetan Plateau, you're still um, the lowest rainwater, still 14 times higher than the, than the, than the drinking water guidelines. So it's, it's quite, you know, there's quite a a big difference between the guideline and, 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 uh, and the levels in, in rainwater anywhere on earth. Surface water will be contaminated from the, from the rainwater. The soil, surface soils will be contaminated from the rainwater. Um, and, you know, you find PFAS everywhere on the earth. Um, you know, you find them in the remotest regions on earth. You find them in the highest mountains, the deepest seas, because they're, they're so persistent and they're quite mobile. So they just spread everywhere. Um, and they've been spreading everywhere for the last decades. Now we, we can't take them away from the environment because they are so persistent. We design chemicals um, which will, will never break down. So they're going to always be there. This is not a great situation to be in where we've contaminated the environment um, to the point where really now just background exposure is, is not really safe and we can't escape it. That's why I said, that's why we say we, um, we've made the planet basically inhospitable for human life um, by, by irreversibly contaminating it now so that nothing, nothing's clean, clean anymore um, to the point where it's clean enough to be considered safe. Um, so that's what I mean by when we say in the paper that we've gone across a planetary boundary. 
And this all raises the question, how do we rid ourselves of these toxic chemicals? Is it even possible? Well, a chem sex study found global societal costs of PFAs chemicals amount to a whopping $16 trillion per year. Regulators have been trying to crack down on PFAs for decades, as 200 million people in the U.S. alone already exposed to PFAs in their tap water. Engineers at the University of British Columbia have developed a water filtration system that permanently removes some of these forever chemicals, but scientists say the technology may not be effective against all types of PFAs. And once saturated, they are considered toxic waste. So if they end up in a landfill, the chemicals recirculate. Engineers still hope to develop filtering material that captures a wide range of PFAs chemicals while simultaneously breaking down the carbon fluorine bonds. I spoke with Hannah Evans about this. She's a senior project officer at FIDRA, a company that describes itself as an environmental charity that's all about supporting sustainability and preventing pollution. Talk about how PFAs get into and spread throughout the environment. PFAS, as we know, are a large group of chemicals and they're used in a wide variety of everyday products. So this can include, for example, food packaging, clothing, furniture, um, amongst many other everyday items. And PFAS can enter the environment through every stage of these products life cycle. So from production through to product use and through to its eventual recycling, reuse or disposal. Once in the environment, we then face a number of issues with PFAS. So PFAS um, are highly mobile. They have the ability to accumulate and build up to harmful concentration levels in both people and wildlife. And this is where they've been connected to human health concerns such as cancer, um, hormone disruption, uh, as well as immune system and neurological issues. Um, and then finally, and perhaps most famously, PFAS are extremely persistent. Um, this has sort of resulted in their secondary name as the forever chemicals. So some PFAS have been found to last up to a thousand years in the environment, which really brings home the importance um, for us to need to act quickly to end PFAS pollution at its source. How much is it a challenge to clean, uh, identify and clean up PFAs? Yes, so this is an ongoing issue. Um, and if we look at monitoring, for example, of PFAS in water supplies, um, taking the UK as an example, uh, PFAS monitoring has typically been quite limited and focuses mostly on PFAS that are already restricted. Um, and this really is a handful of a vast majority of PFAS that are already in use. We're talking thousands of chemicals, um, whereas only a small handful are restricted. So we have already a massive knowledge gap in our understanding of PFAS in the environment and their behaviour and their interactions with other chemicals, which we also know, pollute, we also know to pollute the environment. Um, so then when we look at remediation, it's very expensive and in many cases it's very energy intensive. Uh, so by, it's by no means an option for us to rely on solely. We really do need to be looking at preventing PFAS uh, at its source as the most sustainable solution to protecting the environment. Considering that knowledge gap you talked about um, and how little we know about PFAS, um, do we know enough to figure out how to phase it out of our lives? So where there are PFAS-free alternatives already in existence, absolutely, we need to be moving to these um, straight away. And in areas where this research still needs to continue, then we need time commitments where we can phase out PFAS in future. And it's more complicated uh, getting it out of our food, isn't it? Particularly from treated soil used for agriculture. Yes, absolutely. This is a really difficult, um, a difficult issue, and it's um, it really highlights the breadth of PFAS pollution. So this is, um, for example, two projects that we work on. We've seen PFAS accumulating in, um, as you said, sewage sludge, which is used as usually a wastewater byproduct, which is then applied to agricultural lands, which provides that direct route um, for environmental pollution as well as into our food chains. Um, as well as another paper and cardboard food packaging, which are often identified as compostable, which again leads to that um, sort of circular motion of putting PFAS back into the environment and it potentially into our food sources. Um, and there is no easy fix for this. Uh, again, it's something where we can't really rely on remediation practices. It does need to be stopping PFAS entering the environment at its source. Um, so for PFAS uh, in food packaging, for example, we know that there are PFAS-free alternatives um, and we need greater monitoring and restriction um, on sewage sludge where it's used on agricultural lands. But both of these are just two case studies that really highlight a bigger picture in terms of PFAS pollution. And we do need that broader, more holistic approach to PFAS restriction to truly protect the environment. Frustrating uh, that we know so little, um, and, and in in response, there's so little we can do to con to counter uh, how much we use PFAS, how much they're in our lives. Could you think of 
possibly ways that we can test people looking on can test for PFAS in their homes and their workplace? Um, it's not something that can be easily done at home. So I know we do get this question a lot. People are increasingly concerned with water and um, water contamination of PFAS. Um, there is testing that can be done to test water uh, PFAS in water. But again, it's very expensive. It's a very complex uh, process and it does need to be done in a laboratory setup. It's not something that can be done easily at home. Um, so in terms of a consumer perspective or for members of the general public who are looking to act on PFAS or to voice their concerns around PFAS with their local representatives um, within the UK, within the EU and, and more broadly across the globe. So it really is a pivotal time now to keep the pressure up for a greater action on PFAS. Hannah, as you mentioned, the Globe, we know a lot about actions, lawsuits and uh, legislation that people are crafting in the US and the, in Europe when it comes to PFAS. But can you talk about how big this problem is globally? Absolutely. So in terms of PFAS pollution, if we look at where it is contaminating, this issue is 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 so broad um, in terms of uh, impact on our water supplies, our soil that we've already mentioned. It's in so many consumer products and it's also impacting uh, human beings. It's been found in numerous um, human health studies that were tested in blood serum, for example, and in wildlife species. Um, and we're seeing a very complicated uh, connection between uh, health impacts and wildlife species and then that ability for populations to survive, which are already having very difficult time looking at the broader climate change uh, issues and then the interactions with PFAS in terms of a wider chemical pollution issue um, and I think that PFAS really is a, a, a case study that highlights a bigger issue in terms of chemical pollution it's something that isn't very often talked about but there are a number of chemical groups similar to PFAS that are raising concerns such as flame retardants and bisphenols which in their own right are very concerning but we also don't understand how these uh, chemicals interact and that presents an, an even bigger concern in terms of um, environmental pollution and wildlife survival as well. Meanwhile industry experts have referred to PFAS as the next asbestos even insurance companies are worried that the widely useful but apparently harmful chemicals will put them at risk for claims and litigation. The legal landscape is shifting rapidly. Public awareness of the dangers of PFAs is growing. The last two decades have seen more than 10,000 peer-reviewed studies published on the harms they cause. In light of these, both the United States and the European Union are drafting their own PFAs bans. Companies in these regions already face a flood of lawsuits defendants expand beyond PFAs producers to the auto, food, textiles, cosmetics and paper sectors. 3M in 2022 reached a settlement with the Flemish government in Belgium to the tune of $571 million to compensate for PFAs harms to farmers and the environment. 3M is now in talks with fishing companies in Belgium over damage to their industry and the chemical company Kemmers faces 2,700 charges in the Netherlands. In June this year, 3M reached a $10.3 billion settlement with cities and towns across the U.S. to test for and remove PFAs from public water supplies. The deal followed a $1.19 billion agreement by DuPont, Kemmers and Corteva to do the same. Milliman, the financial consulting firm to the world's largest insurance companies, reports there have already been more than 9,800 PFAs lawsuits alleging exposure since 1999. These affect 140 industries and have resulted in nearly $17 billion in settlements. More than 4,000 lawsuits have already led to one bankruptcy for a U.S. company that produces PFAS-based firefighting foam. Environmental attorneys expect more bankruptcies and estimate potential liability to be in the trillions. And the rising wave of litigation prompted what's called the Investor Initiative on Hazardous Chemicals, representing more than $10 trillion in assets under management by several companies to write a letter to CEOs of the top, the 50 top chemical companies in November, urging them to end production of forever chemicals or risk getting sued. And that's our show, but before I leave you, a community in Greenland is just one example of the scope of the PFAs problem. It's a called Tulumit is one of the most isolated villages in the world about 500 kilometers from the nearest human settlement. The journal Lancet Planetary Health says villagers there had some of the world's highest concentrations of cancer causing PFAs in their blood, thanks to pollution in their hunted meat, like seal and narwhal.